go. And then a quick, so we'll talk about the exam um, a little bit. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into your first real mechanism um, where we'll put to use um, some of those mechanistic patterns. We'll review them real quick and then we'll get into um, how we can apply those. And so this will be our simplest mechanism we will ever cover, it'll be the SN2, stands for substitution, nucleophilic, second order. Um, we'll get into that, some of the variables that go into that mechanism. And then we'll start practice, do some uh, practice with that. And then Thursday, we'll get into elimination reactions. Um, so the second labster that's about substitution versus elimination um, should still make sense, but it'll make more sense once, once we've covered elimination reactions a little bit. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about lab today. Um, so lab, like we've already been mentioning, is, is some labster simulations, but also um, I also was going to take take today's lab section to do a quick um, recap with each of you individually, privately, um, both about anything that you, any questions you have about the class and how things are going, mainly talking about your research projects, your journal articles. Um, so I'm going to put up a, a uh, an announcement either during break or right after this class. Um, where you guys can just reply to that to sign up for a 10 minute time slot um, during our lab section today. And then, um, so you just show up to that. We'll talk, I'll have just reviewed your articles, found as many of them in full text as possible for, um, for those of you who, who weren't able to find the full text articles yet, um, help you pick one, talk about the relevant subjects so I can kind of point you the right direction on that. Um, and that should leave everybody plenty of time to get to um, your local polling place and submit your ballots because everybody needs to vote today, right? Um, my wife was kind enough to leave the house at 730 this morning to drop ours off. So I've got my I voted sticker, but really my wife should have two of them because she's the one who actually left the house and drove there. Um, but yeah, so I make sure that you guys, you only have a 10 minute window that you have to be in lab today. So make sure you get, get uh, your voting, your ballot submitted. Um, and then anybody who is not, I know there's a few people at least that aren't able to be here today. When you watch the videos, don't freak out. Um, if you can't come to Thursday, to Tuesday's lab as scheduled, um, email me and we'll set up a time in office hours or outside of office hours if need be. Um, to make sure that you guys get your your um, uh, conference mini conference um, completed as well. All right, so watch for that announcement as well, and just reply to it. And it's going to be kind of first come first serve. It's only made ten minute time slots, um, so it's not that big of a deal if uh, if you don't get your ideal time slot. But you'll, we'll still be done early either way. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. Then let's look at the exam. Um, I think there are a couple different versions of the exam. So different uh, people's tests look might look a little bit different. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing screen. Um, there we go. Um, but uh, pretty much everybody did pretty well across the board. Um, the biggest place, the biggest problems that people, I saw people had were on problems three and seven. So resonance and problem seven was, the, was uh, I believe the chair compromers. Oh no, sorry, that was the stereochemistry. Um, overall, the multiple choice was tricky for you guys. Um, I didn't make it easy to tell when something was in an antimer or diastereomer, which meant you had to spend more time thinking about it and figuring things out. Um, we'll go over that in a second, but let's look at three first. Um, but Newman projections, chair conformers, you guys all did pretty well. Um, for the uh, resonance structures, and actually I think I have key saved for some of these. Uh, 
Um, so for for the um, test that had a positive charge here, um, one of the keys was to remember that you draw your ar arrows from your electrons to the positive charge. Positive charge is an empty spot in a p orbital. Um, and then there were about four different stereo or uh, resonance structures here that were most of them were about the same level of of stability. All these top three all have secondary carbocations. They're positive charges on a carbon each time. So they're all relatively the same level of stability. Um, the main thing that I was looking for is, did you find this fourth one and rank this as the most stable? Because this does put a positive charge on an oxygen, but this is the only resonance structure that has where everything has a full valence. Um, and then there were considerably more or not considerably or one more um, for this one. And so the key here was to recognize that it um, you had to, the first resonance structure was this carbon oxygen pi bond splitting into a positive charge and a negative charge. And then that positive charge can resonate around by moving electrons towards that positive charge. And again, we wind up with um, some that are relatively close to the same. So the, the starting structure would be your most stable because it doesn't have any formal charges. Everything is neutral and has a full valence up here. Um, for And then the second most stable one is this is the only other resonance structure where everything has a full valence. And then splitting apart the carbocation ones, the one where the two primaries are going to be the least stable and the one that has a positive charge right next to the negative is a little bit less stable than the one where your positive and your negative are separated by a larger distance. Um, but they're close to the same level of stability. And then the one where you have put your positive, your carbocation on a secondary carbon can be more stable than either of those others, but less stable than either of the two structures where everything has a full valence. Um, overall, I, I wasn't surprised that this was a tricky um, problem that you guys struggled with this because resonance structures are one of the, the trickiest concepts that we've gone over so far. Um, and we'll keep practicing with that, especially when we get to next, to next quarter um, we'll do a little bit, we'll keep bringing resonance back this quarter, but the next quarter is when it really becomes important. Uh, and then the other, the other possibility was I switched the positive to a negative on some of the tests. And so that meant you needed to switch which way you drew your arrows for A. Instead of a pi bond moving towards an empty P orbital, you had an, a lone pair on a carbon that had to move towards the ring and make, then you had to make room for it. And so there were only three resonance structures here. The oxygen can't participate at all because the oxygen can only be giving electron density. And we need, we already have extra electron density in here because we're moving the negative charge into the ring. Uh, and these are all gonna be approximately equal Although if you if you mess that up, I did not grade down on that because you guys were looking for one, two, three on these. Um, so I was not too too harsh on that. Um, and then I think all three of the tests had the same part B. So same same logic. Any questions on the resonance? Everybody, now that I pointed out, sees what went wrong. All right, key, remember you're drawing arrows from the electrons to a positive charge. Make sure you don't, don't draw any carbons with five bonds. If you go back and look at your resonance structures, I think better than half of you had at least one resonance structure drawn that had five bonds on a carbon. Um, so watch out for that still. Uh, and then seven. So most of you guys figured out that 
it was the same molecules for all the versions of the test, just in different orders, I believe. Um, although I think I may have flipped one, I flipped these ones in one of them. Um, most of you realize that the cyclohexane molecule, despite it, the fact that it looks like we, we flipped all of the stereocenters, it's actually the same molecule. It is that, has that internal mirror plane that makes it meso as opposed to being um, R versus S. And if you took this molecule and you flipped it like a pancake, you would get this molecule. Um, most of you guys caught that. Where you guys struggled a little bit was on these ones, the, um, the hexane, the dihalogenated di hexane, and on the cyclohexane that was drawn as, as the, um, as the uh, chair conformers. So this one, almost all of you guys saw was constitutional isomer. These ones were tricky. This, is, this one was actually the enantiomer, the ones drawn as the chair conformers. Because if you look at it and you actually assign R versus S for both of these, both of these are trans. So they're not diastereomers because if, if it was diastereomers, um, you would have to be flipping the flipping the um, stereochemistry on one of the stereocenters, but not the other, which means if you had trans, it would go to being cis and vice versa. And it's hard to see in the equatorial position here, this the one, version on the left, it's easy to see that it's trans, right? You've got one sticking straight up and one sticking straight down. This one is trans also. It's just a little bit harder to see it. And it switched the stereochemistry on each of these. For the one on the left, um, one of them is all, I think they're one's R and one's S, and then here they're one's S and, and the other's R. So this was an enantiomer. And this one, despite the fact that I drew it so that they had the halogen was going into the board in both cases, um, because other things switched positions, one of them is one of them is RR, I think, and the other one is RS, if I'm remembering properly. So these would be the diastereomers because one of the stereocenters flips and not the other. The bromine stereocenter does not change. Right, so that was a little tricky. The other thing that, um, and the, what I saw that, that gave people the most trouble with figuring out R versus S, and that includes for the multiple choice section up here, um, was the fact that the hydrogens were not drawn. So you had to draw the hydrogens in and decide where they were. Um, Cause I saw at least a few people that drew their, let me pull up, uh, where's my PDF? That's the one I want. Um, there were at least a few people who drew their uh, wedge for their hydrogen like that. And if you don't draw your wedge in the same direction as your dashes, then that actually is going to change where you draw it, where you number everything, and which way you draw your arrow when you go back through. So when you go back and draw, draw out the stereo center in detail, make sure that you get that last bond that's not shown explicitly pointed in the right direction. Because if you did, or if you did this with the hydrogen on the left-hand side, you put your dotted, your dashed line up, that's gonna totally mess everything up if you, when you try to do any rotations. This one, you wouldn't need to do any rotations necessarily, so it wouldn't be that big of a deal here but getting them pointed in the wrong direction will switch which way you draw your arrow. So watch out for that. So what's right? Can you do it correctly? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so the, the hydrogen arrow should be drawn the same direction, more or less, 
as the dotted line because remember those are always going to be pointed roughly 120 degrees from the other two when we look at it from above so that means we have one to two to three except we're looking from the other direction so when we flip it around it would wind up being at um r it's counterclockwise here but that's with the hydrogen sticking out towards us so then when we step behind the screen or flip the molecule around we should get r And that applies to um, the ones up here as well. And if you went through and assigned for each of these, um, so there it is. Our hydrogen would be up here. And if we assign priority, it would go. one two three so that would be r except we got the hydrogen sticking towards us so we want the opposite of that so this one would be s and this one would be we'd, we'd see one two three again with the hydrogen pointing towards us so this one is also s And when we look at the other side, one, two, three, and with the hydrogen point, so that's already counterclockwise. So now with the hydrogen pointing towards us, that one becomes R. This one, everything's still in the same place relative to each other. One, two, three. So clockwise, but backwards. So this one is still S. All right, so SS versus RS, we put one of the stereo centers, not the other. That makes it a diastereomer. And then same for this for this molecule up here, if we assigned all the, the priority, we'll find that both of them are flipped. When we look at the top one, it's a little bit harder to visualize, and this one definitely might want to draw in your hydrogen. And then when you're numbering these, it's going to go one, two, three for this first stereo center. And the hydrogen is sticking straight up. So we would need to take this molecule and rotate it so that the hydrogen was facing away, which would make it R. Or if you visualize this, if you think of it as being flat and put it above your head and look straight up at it so that the hydrogen is pointing away from you, it would be clockwise on the ceiling. Um, and then, and when we do the same, the same, it is, it gets really tricky to draw your, to draw this out when it's still in the chair conformer. And so it can be advantageous to redraw it as a regular tetrahedral carbon with just the priority assigned so that you can keep track of this. because that would make it a lot easier to rotate everything around in your head too, right? Because we're used to that. It's a little harder to visualize spinning around this big, big ring structure. Any, any other questions on the test? Your feedback did not have, have it broken down by problem. If you're interested in how you did problem by problem, um, I can. Um, send you a message. Just send, if you send me a message on Canvas asking for that, then I'll give you yours. I still won't have much feedback on it, but you can at least see where what sections um, did you miss your um, your points on. The mechanisms in general, you guys did really well. Um, although I was a little surprised how many of you guys missed. Um, missed the some of the 
um, proton transfer steps when leaving group leaves. This one in particular, all right, it's not that version of it. It was, where's, I need test C. If you got test C, yours looked like this for the first section. And I was, there were kind of two steps in this last one. So I took either leaving group, leaving group leaves is what I was looking for here. Um, but if you pro, pro, proton transfer, you still got full credit for it because technically this last step is both a leaving group leaving and a proton being transferred to something else um, that I just edited out for the sake of, of clarity so that you guys, because I was not trying to ask about that one as much. Um, but remember, anytime you have fewer sigma bonds and it's, and it's not a proton transfer, that's a leaving group leaves. Which becomes important today because we're going to be talking about leaving groups a lot today. Any other questions on the test? Anything else that's been bugging you since uh, since Sunday night or since whenever you took the test that you you wanted some clarification on? Sean, actually, I have some clarification on I think R and S, but I don't. It's just simple ideas of ranking one to three. Um, I don't know if you want to go over that now or is it more personal? Yeah, so what, did it have to do with the um, with the double bond? Yeah, well, that's, I don't know. That's what I'm just confused about because I ranked the the ISO group as number one because I thought it would be attached, number one, to then it's attached to two carbons as opposed to part of the um, the chain that's then attached to two hydrogen. So I wouldn't that be one as opposed to three? And then also, yeah, then with the double bond and everything. I so we look at it on one, one step at a time. And so for, the, for this isopropyl group, you, your first step away from the stereo center, everything's a carbon in every direction. So it's all tied. Mm -hmm. We're only looking in one direction at a time, though. So despite the fact that this isopropyl group is attached to two other carbons, you can only step one way along that chain to try and break the tie. You're not trying to break the tie by looking at everything that's attached. You're looking at one part of it at a time that's attached. So you, it goes carbon for everything. Everything takes a second step and is another carbon. But then the isopropyl group from here, from whichever way you drew your line, the next step has to be to a hydrogen, which means the isopropyl group loses because the carbon chain's not as long. Gotcha. It doesn't have to do with how many carbons are attached. It's the length of the carbon chain. Bef because that's when you were going to run out of carbons and have to use a hydrogen to try and break the tie. Once you get to the end here, your next largest atom that's attached would be a hydrogen. Um, gotcha. As far as the double bond versus all single bonds, the, the easy way to remember it with the, the double bonds have a complicated rule that basically means you can go you can cross back the way you came um which means you count those carbons twice but what it comes down to is um pick the more complicated side if everything's all carbon and it's the same length around the ring in both directions if we're trying to break the tie um the next time so after you go one two three, four, and everything's tied, and one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, and then that we're going around the ring again, if we're going the second time. The, this basically gives us a third way we can count to try and break the tie, it having that, we can, we can cross that bond again and consider it a different um, substituent because it's two bonds is the way they, they justify that. The, Easy way to remember it is that a pi bond is more complicated than a sigma bond. So it's going to be higher priority, everything else being equal. If we don't have a different atom um, with a larger atomic number, then the side that's got the pi bond is higher priority. If there was a, even just a fluorine here, 
on this side, this side would be the higher priority. But the fact that all we have is carbons and hydrogen the, and everything else is identical, the side with the double bond um, has, is the higher priority. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just, I, I, yeah, I got confused somehow it's with, I was just thinking larger molecules and not necessarily like what you said, the, the actual length of the chain, but I see it now. Thanks. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and like I said, and, you know, there, there might come a time sometime where if you're taking a standardized test that has OCAM on it, where you don't remember these rules that clearly and you need to assign RNS, got to take a guess. And so your your approach of, well, this one looks more complicated, the isopropyl looks more complicated. So I'm going to say that that's the higher priority. It's not a bad approach to take. Um, you just have to remember that the most important thing is the length of the chain. And then if you get hung up on something, a pi bond or something else, then go with whatever side's more complicated. Sean, can you talk about the kinetics question? Yes. Um, so everybody got a, every version got a slightly different um, potential energy surface, but so the exact numbers, steps are gonna be slightly different, um, but they all had the same concepts, right? Whatever, if it says what step is the slowest, it's gonna be the one with the highest transition state energy. If it's asking which step is the fastest, you're looking for the one that has the lowest transition state barrier. Um, and if you're looking for which step would be the largest equilibrium constant, it's not just the largest difference in energy, it's the largest downhill difference in energy. Unless you wrote, um, let me th think of, like you could write, if you wanted to know what the largest equilibrium constant was here, it's going to be the one where you, you're most downhill in energy, which would be from two to three in this case. Um, if you want to look know what's the smallest equilibrium constant, it's going to be the exact opposite. And so it would be the one that's most uphill in energy gives you the smallest equilibrium constant. Because small equilibrium constant means that it favors keeping things as the reactant, right? In other words, that the reactants are more stable than the products. A small equilibrium constant means the bottom half of that equilibrium expression is larger than the top half. And the first rule of equilibrium is products over reactants, right? So, equilibrium constant is going to be small when you favor keeping everything as the reactants. Equilibrium constant is going to be big when you favor making the product. Um, and one of these, I actually asked you a question that I think it's on A. Um, I actually gave you an example that uh, is not possible because I gave you a potential energy surface where it favors being spun, or it says it's spontaneous at this temperature because it's downhill, delta G is negative from one to four. Um, but then I said the overall reaction is endothermic and delta S is less than zero, which that can't be the case for a reaction that's spontaneous. This reaction, if, I, if you actually had a reaction with these characteristics, it would never be spontaneous at any temperature because both of our pieces of the delta G equation favor being non-spontaneous. Um, but it didn't matter as far as answering the question. So I didn't, uh, I didn't just give everybody a pass on that because with these properties, if it's endothermic and delta S is less than zero, what happens if you decrease the temperature? And the key to that is part of it is for reaction rate, right? Reaction rate's just tied to temperature, right? Um, changing the temperature doesn't affect the transition state energy. So reaction rate is temperature goes down, your rate goes down. Temperature goes up, your rate goes up. For the equilibrium constants, 
we have to remember our our equation here. If we have a reaction where it's endothermic, so that's positive, and delta S is negative, so we've got minus a negative. No matter what temperature we are at, we're going to get a positive number for delta G. Right, so delta G is going to be positive. The reaction is non spontaneous no matter what temperature we are at. But the question is what happens when we change temperature? Does it, what happens to K? In other words, does delta G get closer to being spontaneous? Does, does it get closer to zero or does it get less favorable? And since this, is, this term favors being non-spontaneous, when temperature goes down, this whole term gets smaller. So it's still going to be non-spontaneous, but it's less non-spontaneous. Delta G is going to get closer to zero. If delta G is getting closer to zero, that means that K is going to be getting bigger. It's still going to be less than one. K is still going to be small, but it's going to be bigger than it was at the higher temperature. And so the, the specifics of exothermic, endothermic, or delta S being positive or negative, or I even threw in zero on one of them. Um, if delta, if delta S was zero, then changing the temperature is going to have no effect on delta G, right? Turns out the way I phrased this, the equilibrium constant will still change because there was that expression. But if this, I was, if you said no change, then I didn't mark you wrong because that's what I was actually getting at. But a few of you realized that even if delta G is not changing, that temperature right there was changing. And so as long as you recognize that the temperature was going to affect that, let's see, it would say an increase in temperature means this whole term is going to get smaller, which means we're going to be getting closer to one. So that means K would be decreasing in that case. Um, and a couple of you even managed to bring in Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle actually is the easiest way to think about that. If it's exothermic and entropy is not playing a role, then you can treat heat as though it's a product, right? And if you increase the temperature, that's going to drive the reaction towards the reactants because you're adding a product. You guys remember Le Chatelier's principle? That was a long time ago, right? Um, but it still holds when we don't have an entropy piece in play, when we're just looking at enthalpy, we can just treat heat energy as being either a product or a reactant. And in this case, it's exothermic heat is a product, which means when you add more heat, when you increase the temperature, you're going to drive the reaction back towards the reactants. Again, that's really, that's not a concept that we spend much time on in this class, but there was, there were a couple people that actually brought Le Chatelier's in and used, they didn't say Le Chatelier's, I don't think, but um, just talked about it in terms of pushing the reaction equilibrium towards the products, um, which would mean K decreases. So, um, does that, uh, John, did I answer the questions that you had there? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else, anything specific here or general? Hang on one sec. 
sorry, my son just decided to jump in here and ask me to fix his internet problems with his Zoom that's going on right now. Um, and so I thought I'd give you guys a second to collect your thoughts. Um, all right, we good on tests? Anything else uh, you guys want to talk about? Did you, I'm sorry, I had to step away from my computer. Did you talk about the chair conformer problem at all? We did not yet. Yeah, I was just confused because um, from my knowledge, I don't remember going over a chair conformer with like multiple um, like ethyl groups coming off of it. Um, off we did it in the lab. Okay, right. So we did practice it a little bit with the lab, mostly with just methyls, mm -hmm. but the same, the same concepts apply. Um, depending on what version of the test you had, and it, the biggest thing that, that really tripped, tri tripped you guys up um, was getting it from being drawn flat to um, the correct chair conformer, because it was pretty common for you guys to start with a trans, but then draw the cis conformer when you put it in the chair formation. Um, so that, that was one of the trickiest things here. And um so if we if we wanted to try and redraw this and most of you guys did what i would have would have done which is take this um carbon on the right hand side and put that as the headrest which would make the isopropyl group in this case would be on the the back um armrest if you want to put it that way. And then, so then it's a matter of making sure you draw it in the right configuration. If this one's going to be up, then that means this one is going to be equatorial when you draw it. Because if our two positions here, look like So if this was our ethyl group and here was our isopropyl, our other position for this one is over here, right? So that would be the below the ring if we flattened it out. Our two positions over here are going away from us into the board, sort of generally in the down, downward direction or straight up like that. So the one that's going to make it trans would not be like this. It would be, that would be the hydrogen. That would be the trans conformer. And so then the trick is when you do your chair flip, realizing that this is gonna go from axial to equatorial this one goes from equatorial to axial. And so we got something that looks, would look like, and you can let her go, Bill. Yeah, let her go, please. Oh, sorry, busy house this morning. Um, so then we went in both cases, I think in all the different versions of the test, there was, they were all one, three were the two substituents. So it was a matter of realizing, okay, if one's going to be axial and one's got to be equatorial, the stable conformer is the one that puts the larger group, which would be the isopropyl into the equatorial position. So this one would be stable. And most of you guys had no problem with that. And once you drew a chair conformer, most of you guys did the chair flip correctly. But a lot of times what happened was you guys didn't draw your chair, your first chair conformer correctly, which meant even when you did your chair flip properly and labeled which one would be right out of the two that you drew, you didn't draw the right two. Um, so if, if anybody lost points on that section, that I think, uh, there might have been one or two cases of somebody messing up a chair flip, for, but for the most part, 
The issue was just getting it drawn properly. Up over there, Bay. Um, did that answer your questions? Do you have anything more specific? Well, I mean, I was just confused if we were to draw the like the the whole ethyl group or what is that um, the um, propyl whatever. Um, your, or, your methyl ethyl or your isopropyl. Right. Yeah. If we were to draw that all out, or if we would have just like written the words for it, because so far we've only done methyl groups, and that's just a straight line. So. Um. So if I didn't mark anybody down for that, as long as you kept track of which one was which, at least at least one person use ET for ethyl and um, you can use, there's a shorthand for isopropyl as well. It's probably lowercase i and a capital P, PR or something like that. Um, so it would have been, so I, I didn't mark anybody down for that, but and typically though you would want to show it something like what I have here, so, just so that you can keep track of what's the bigger substituent. Um, but but again, I wasn't being very super harsh on that. I was mainly just looking for could you did you draw it right? Did you do the ring flip correctly? And then did you pick, you know, based on what you drew, did you pick the right conformer being more stable? Over there, okay. All right. Any anything else test wise? Um, like I said, overall you guys did did pretty well. The the average was and it's a real small sample size with only ten of you, so an average doesn't necessarily tell us that much. Um, but you know the average was in the eighties, so you guys did did pretty well. And remember that class, my classes are designed so that one bad test is not going to sink you. And the good news about if you did, if you did bomb this test, um, or feel like you bombed it relative to what you should have gotten, remember that all you have to do to bring your grade up now is do better on the next test. Um, if you get a, if you got something in the 70s, and you get the exact same score on your next test, your grades not going to change, it's not going to go down because um, even if it's lower than your total grade in the class because of the way the weighted categories work. And all you have, that means to go for, if you're sitting at an 89 and a half going into the final and you got an 80% on the first test, all you have to do is get an 82 and it's going to bring your grade up. Because all you have to do is improve on what you did on the first test to bring your grade up. It doesn't matter what, what the rest of your overall grade is because of how these weighted categories work. Sean, are the current canvas grades reflective of uh, the proper weights? I believe so. Um, I can double check that real quick. Um, yeah, and it also is set up to drop your lowest assignment score um, as well. So you have you get one dropped assignment lab lab or otherwise it's probably going to be a lab because that's most of our assignments have been labs. Um, so and that's all already taken into account. Um, so don't be waiting for a last minute bump when I drop grades because that's already being done or when you when I drop an assignment. Um, that's already taken into account. All right. Last chance. If you still have more questions, you can ask um, privately if you want, or in uh, in lab if you like. Mm, it's eight fifty. That makes a very convenient time to go ahead and take our break. Then, and let's uh, go ahead and take a ten minute break. Let's come back at nine o'clock, and uh, we'll start getting into new stuff.
All right, let's go ahead and review our, our four most significant um, mechanism patterns at this point. Um, and just a reminder that the, the most important, especially for the, for the reactions we're going to be going over here, are going to be one and two, nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaves. Um, rearrangements and proton transfers. Proton transfers are really, they're really important as far as actually getting the product that we want to get at any given point. And they're, they're important as far as sort of um, supporting the overall reaction. But a lot of times that generally speaking, the nucleophilic attack and leaving group leave are what are actually going to um, be the sort of the meat and potatoes of, of these reactions. And then the proton transfers are just going to sort of either get the molecule to the point where a leaving group can leave or sort of clean up the fact after a nucleophilic attack happens and you have an oxygen with an extra bond. And then you, so then you have a proton transfer afterwards to sort of clean everything up. Um, and then a rearrangement in many cases, we're gonna see that rearrangements actually wind up being um, less than desirable. We, want, we need to be aware that they happen, but if we're trying to make a specific molecule, a lot of times a rearrangement is a pain because it keeps us from putting our new, our new substituent, having our nucleophilic attack occur on the carbon where we want it. And so it's more something we need to be, a wrinkle that we need to be aware of um, and it's less often is it going to be the most important part of an overall mechanism. Um, our, we're going to start, we're going to start by talking about reactions of alkyl halides and alkyl halides are just alkanes, um, mostly alkanes, but, um, uh, we're also going to talk about these other different classes as well. Um, alkyl halides means you have an alkane with a halogen attached to it. So a halo alkane or an alkyl halide are describing the same thing. Um, if you have a halogen attached to a carbon that's in a double bond, we call that a vinyl halide, um, which that's actually where um, PVC pipe gets its name. PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. So that's PVC is the polymer that you get when you start with vinyl chloride and let it react with itself to make big long molecules. Um, and aerial halides or phenyl halides are going to be sa the same thing except with your halide is attached to a benzene ring. These two, the two with the pi bonds involved, don't go through the same classes of reactions that the alkyl halides do. So we're specifically going to be looking at alkyl halides for this chapter, which means we're talking about sp3 carbons that have a halogen attached. <clears throat> um, we already know how to name those. Just throw bromo, chloro, iodo, fluoro as a prefix. Um, and the nice thing is they really only go through two reactions, um, which means we don't have a, a lot of functional groups have a much lo longer list of possible reactions they can go through. Alkyl halides only really go through two reactions. Um, the first of which is substitution. And essentially what you do in a substitution is it's exactly what it sounds like. You take your alkyl halide, you pull the halide off and you replace it with something else with a with a nucleophile. Um, and the other class of reactions is called elimination. And the formatting got a little screwy here. Um, and so elimination reactions are kind of similar. In both cases, you wind up with the, the halide just sort of leaves. In substitution, the halide is replaced by a nucleophile in elimination, you just, instead of having a nucleophile that's going to attack the carbon, you have a base that's gonna pull a hydrogen off of the carbon next door. 
And the result is if it's a substitution, you put you attach and make a new sigma bond, attach it to the to the um, same carbon that had the leaving group. If it's an elimination, we have a, we make a pi bond. We're going to wind up making an alkene um, by pulling a proton off of the carbon next to where our halogen was. And we'll see why that makes sense here in a minute, but let's talk about substitution first because it's a little bit simpler of a mechanism. Um, at its most basic, no pun intended, um, all you have to do is you just look for what's going to be a nucleophile, what's going to be attracted to a positive charge and where your halogen is. And you're just going to pull the halogen off and stick the, the nucleophile on instead. So the product of this reaction here is actually pretty easy to draw. It's still going to be the same propyl group. We're just going to replace the chlorine with an OH. Because the hydroxide here has a negative charge, right? And negative charges are going to be attracted to a positive charge. So a negative charge is a good nucleophile because it's going to be attracted to a positive charge. And then our byproduct is just going to be, we still have the sodium ion floating around. And then the chloride just gets paired up with the sodium. But really, we just wind up with the chloride floating around. We're just replacing the chloride with the hydroxide. That's why they call it a substitution. Pull one thing out, put in something else. If it went through an elimination, the same basic thing is going to happen. But instead of, we're still going to wind up with the chlorine leaving and taking its electrons with it. The difference between a substitution and an elimination is we have all these hydrogens on the carbons next door to our halogen. And if we have some a good base, we're calling it a base, not a nucleophile, but it's going to be the same molecule. The hydroxide is a good base and a good nucleophile. So if it's a good base, that means it can basic it can just come over and grab one of the protons next door instead of attacking the carbon in an elimination reaction it's going to grab a proton from the carbon next door which frees up a pair of electrons to make a new pi bond so our product in this case would look like this plus h2o Plus, we still are going to have the sodium and the chloride floating around. So the, and again, I'll walk you through how we know what, whether um, substitution or elimination happens. There's a couple of key variables that we can look at to decide which of these is going to happen. But the, the main point is that both of these are going to happen at the same time. You can't have this substitution reaction happen without making a little bit of the elimination product. And you can't have an elimination happen without making a little bit of the substitution product. These are always going to be competing reactions. And when we see, when we look at the mechanisms, um, what we can see places where we can, we can tweak things to make it favor the substitution versus the elimination. Um, but they're, they're always going to be both happening at the same time. It's just a matter of which one is the, what we call the major product is going to be the one that we get more of. Or like in this case, if I just say it goes through an elimination, what's the product? If I just tell you, ignore whatever else is happening and just show me the elimination product, then I do, I'm saying I don't care about the substitution product. I'm most interested in the elimination product. 
right? So if we actually did this reaction, if we took two chloro pro, uh, propane, exposed it to sodium hydroxide, realistically, we're going to get both products. And depending on the conditions, we can favor the elimination versus a substitution or vice versa. And, but you might notice that this is not balanced at this point when we write it like this. Um, organic chemists get sloppy with their balancing is what it comes down to. Um, if we were being careful, we would say something like if we had a percentage, say our major product was 65% of our of our um, uh, chloropropane turned into the elimination product and the remaining 35% turned into the substitution product, those should add up to one in theory, which means it's not, we're not breaking laws of conservation of mass or anything like that. We're still limited by how much reactant we start with. Um, but it's, it's frequently not shown as exactly balanced because that would mean we also need to have like, instead of, because only one of those two reactions made H2O, right? Only the elimination did, which means if this was balanced, we, we would need this to be um, 0.65 moles of H2O to match the 65% over here. And it just makes your balancing get really, really messy if you actually try to keep organic reactions totally balanced. Um, so it's, don't get too hung up on that. We're not breaking laws of conservation of mass. Um, it's just frequently more trouble than it's worth to keep it perfectly balanced. As long as you know that these two products are going to be formed in a one-to-one -one ratio based on how much of the reactant is used for each of those reactions. Right, so your the and it doesn't change how we do a theoretical yield, right? If I wanted to know what the theoretical yield was for the elimination product, I would still start by assuming it's one to one, and I would ignore the side products that could form. Right, we basically would treat it as though it was only going through one of those reactions. All right, so how do we know which one of these we're going to favor? Um, in general, the most important thing is um, basically we need to know how good of a leaving group something is, and we need to know how strong of a nucleophile or base we have in order to predict which of these. And as far as the, the halides go, um, we mostly care about how good they are as a leaving group. If we want to know what mechanism and what reaction is going to be favored, we, it's going to change slightly depending on what our halide actually is. Because the larger the halide, the more stable it is on its own, which means that the better leaving group it is. So iodide is a much better leaving group than bromide, which is much better than chloride, which is much, much better than fluoride. And we see the same thing with how acidic they are. Hydroiodic acid is a stronger acid than hydrobromic acid, which is a stronger acid than hydrochloric acid. And hydrofluoric acid is the only one of those that's a weak acid in general, or weak acid according to our, our uh, terminology from GenChem. Weak meant that it didn't dissociate 100% in water, right? Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic were all strong acids, meaning you put it in water, it dissociates 100%. Hydrofluoric was the only one that didn't dissociate 100%. And that's tied to the same thing here. It's, it's also the worst leaving group because it's the most electronegative. Um, and it's, which is also tied to how big the ion is because that fluorine the fluoride, you're only looking at the second energy level. Those electrons are so close to the nucleus that they wind up, it winds up being kind of stuck in these covalent bonds and not being able to get away from these covalent bonds as well, despite the fact it's more electronegative. Um, and so they, and the, how good they are as a leaving group is, is 
all tied to both how big they are and how electronegative they are. The bigger the ion, the stronger the base it is, or sorry, the stronger the acid, the conjugate acid would be, and the better leaving group. Um, and so we can actually use um, acidity and pKa's as a way to judge how good of a leaving group is. Because if something is a really good, if the conjugate acid is a really good acid, that means it's a really, really weak base. And if it's a really, really weak base, it's also a really good leaving group. Right, so the, the best leaving groups are the, the conjugate acid is the strongest and the conjugate base is the weakest. The most stable bases are the ones that are the best by themselves. Right, so we can we can use this this chart, and again, we're mostly going to be looking at um, the alkyl halides, and you'll notice all the three best alkyl halides. If you if you ignore fluorine, since that's the one that's kind of the exception, iodide, bromide, and chloride are all up here as being really good leaving groups, which means anything else that's down here, any of these other um, compounds that are below chloride, for instance, any of these other leaving groups could actually be used as a nucleophile in a substitution reaction because they're going to be better at forming covalent bonds and not as good at leaving. And so that's what substitution reactions fundamentally are is you're replacing a good leaving group, which is a, a bad base, a, the most stable base gets replaced with something that's not as good of a leaving group, right? So in theory, you could use chloride as your nucleophile to replace iodide because iodide is a better leaving group than chloride is. And then you could turn around and you could expose that chloride to water and water is a good enough nucleophile that it would actually replace the chloride as as uh, by acting as a nucleophile right so as long as you're moving down this chart you're going to be making something that's more stable in other words something that's favored by equilibrium so if we look at these two Frequently, we don't have the entire chart shown like this. If you look in the inside the cover of almost any um, OCHEM textbook out there, there's a pKa table of different functional groups because that allows us to predict what's a better leaving group. And so but it's not usually as detailed as this one, but it has all the same information if you just have a list of pKa's and functional groups, right? Because whatever is the strongest acid means the conjugate base is going to be the best leaving group. So out of these two molecules, which is a better, which has a better leaving group. This, there'd be one leaving group. Here's the other leaving group. Yeah, the bromine would be a better leaving group. Bromine's all the way up here. The hydroxide's all the way down here. Because we're looking at what's, um, we're looking at the molecule that's missing the red H in this case. The red H is the acidic proton. And so we're looking at the conjugate base for each of these. So we're not looking at this one. That would be if the the conjugate base of hydronium is water, right? So if H2O was our leaving group, we'd be looking at this value here. So that would be, and this is why proton transfer steps wind up being important. One of, one of the reasons, because if I have a, if I want to make the, I don't want a highlighter. Nobody's ever wanted a highlighter. Um, if I if I wanted to make the oxygen a better leaving group, 
I could do this under acidic conditions and protonate that OH group. Now all of a sudden my leaving group is water, it's not hydroxide. And I just jumped from here to here on this table. Because now my leaving group is a lot better leaving group. So a lot of times we'll look at things where the proton transfer step winds up being really important for making something a better leaving group. Because you, just by sticking an H in the right spot, we can make it. And if you look at these numbers, we went from a pKa of 15.7 to a pKa of negative two, which is, and remember, P, pH is a logarithmic scale, right? So in terms of equilibrium constants, we just made it a better leaving group by a factor of 10 to the 18 times better leaving group than it was just by adding a proton in the right spot. And so that's that's kind of what I meant when I earlier when I was talking about proton transfer steps wind up being important, but they're not the, the base for this entire reaction. They kind of support this reaction. And the same thing would be true if you had water acting as a nucleophile, replacing a chlorine, uh, a chloride in a um, substitution reaction, we would then wind up deprotonating it at the end at, as our final step towards making our product. How about these two? If we have the protonated oxygen versus fluoride. The protonated oxygen. Yeah, they wind up being, we're comparing these two now, right? So if they're in both cases, the leaving group leave step is gonna look the same, but because we've got a pKa of negative two for the protonated oxygen versus a pKa of three for fluoride, the protonated oxygen winds up being the better leaving group. John, can you talk about uh, what you said earlier that fluorine's an exception? Yes. Um, so we, you might think that fluorine being so electronegative means that it'd be a better leaving group. Like you, that kind of, you could make that make sense in your head, but you need to remember that that the the smaller the atoms get the better they are at making these covalent bonds because the tighter their electrons are to the nucleus. And so that's why we kind of, we follow the same trend for all of the, the halides. Fluorine is not a great leaving group. Chlorine is better than fluorine, but it's not as good at bromine. Basically the bigger we get, the less electronegative we get, but at the same time, the bigger the atom itself gets, which means it's not as good at sharing its electrons, at least especially in the case of with small atoms like carbon. Carbon and fluorine are really close to the same size, right? They're the same row of the periodic table, which means their orbitals are close to the same size and they can overlap really, really well, which means strong covalent bonds. The bigger mismatch you get between the energy level of your of one atom and the energy level of the other, the less their orbitals can overlap because they're just physically a different size. And that means that's a weaker covalent bond. Um, did you guys, when you guys did crystal structures last year with Carl, did you guys talk about the size of the ions? It's sort of a, it's a topic that might have gotten mentioned, might not spend a ton of time on it. And crystal structures, as and it's on its own, is a really complicated and and uh, traumatic subject um, because they're so complicated and hard to visualize. Um, but it's it's has similar things. Crystal structures are most stable when your ions are close to the same size. If your ions aren't close to the same size, then they don't wind up making very stable crystal structures because you can't pack them in very well, right? Because it makes it hard to alternate a really, really small 
ion with a really, really big ion. And so we have something some somewhat similar here. We get the strongest covalent bonds when the atoms are in the same row of the periodic table. And the bigger the mismatch, the weaker the covalent bonds are, which is why fluorine is not a hydrofluoric acid is not a strong acid for the same reason, but hydrochloric acid is. Hydrochloric acid, that's a really weak covalent bond because hydrogen and chloride are separated by two whole rows on the periodic table. And hydrogen and bromine are separated by even more. Does that make sense? I think so. So basically, you would expect the the fluorine to be higher up on that on that list, essentially. You would normally, but because of that mismatch, it doesn't wind up being as high up as we would think. It's still higher up uh, than oxygen and nitrogen, which follows our trend when it comes to electronegativity, right? Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, we would expect them, since they're all in the same row of the periodic table, we would expect their bonds to be close to the same strength and fluorine to be a better leaving group than, than hydroxide or a nitrogen because it's more electronegative. Um, but it's not as good a leaving group as those other halogens that have that bigger mismatch in size. All right, so the, the rest of, of today's lecture, we're gonna go through what, how they first figured out this mechanism because it's one of the simplest mechanisms like I've mentioned. It's also was one of the first ones historically that they started compiling good evidence that the mechanism happened a certain way. Um, so we're gonna go through kind of the, the logic that was used historically. Um, and so basically started with, they had two possible options. And let me fix that real quick. And I don't know why it is number one and number one, but it is right now. I think you guys can count to two though by this point. I think we've established you guys can count all the way to four, but not five at this point. So um, I'm not too worried about it. So basically when they were started looking at these substitution reactions, they kind of came up with two possible mechanisms. Um, and the first that they said was, okay, well, it could be a concerted mechanism. This could be a reaction that happens all at once. Um, in other words, you've got your nucleophilic attack and your leaving group leaving happening at the same time, which seems reasonable, right? Although we don't, we didn't practice drawing multiple steps at the same time yet. So be a little bit more complicated than we were we'd be used to. Um, the stepwise mechanism means that it, it progresses in multiple steps. Your leaving group leaves, and then you have the nucleophilic attack happening, right? And it's in two distinct steps. So these were the two possible mechanisms that they started looking at. And so the natural, the natural thought process was, well, how the heck do we prove which of these is correct? Because this isn't chemistry as, as a whole, it's a very hard subject to design really, really good experiments for, right? Because we're dealing with things that are so small, we can't directly measure them. So OCHEM in particular, but chemistry in general as well, we kind of have to get clever with how we design our, re our experiments in order to test our hypotheses, right? Um, we, I don't think we did this lab last year, but there's a lab where we can actually measure Avogadro's number by hand. And it's a really convoluted lab because you're trying to actually directly count the number of molecules. Um, and trying to design an experiment where you do that is really tricky. There's you know, so many different steps 
Um, so this, the way that they started gathering evidence for this, they started by looking at the rate law. And they noted, and they noticed, okay, concerted mechanisms are second order, meaning you need both of them are involved in the rate law. If you change your concentration of the halide, you change the rate of the reaction. Or if you change your concentration of the nucleophile, you change the rate of the reaction. And because for it to be a concerted reaction, you need both of these molecules to run into each other for anything to happen. If it's a stepwise mechanism, that's not necessarily the case, right? The slow step might be the leaving group leaves and then your nucleophile could come in. But if the slow step is step one, if this is the step that has the highest activation energy, then adding more nucleophile won't make your reaction go faster. Because no matter how much nucleophile you have sitting around waiting, you're still waiting on this carbocation to show up before anything can happen, right? So if it's a concerted mechanism, we would expect it to be a second order reaction where you need both of these are going to be in the rate law and changing the concentration of either of them changes the rate of the reaction. Um, and so we refer to this mechanism, the concerted mechanism as being second order or bimolecular. Um, so the shorthand for this mechanism we call it SN2, substitution, nucleophilic, second order, right? Which means there's a possibility that it's SN1 as well. SN1 would follow that step mechanism where your leaving group leaves and then your nucleophile comes in. So let's pretend we're doing these experiments and we do a, a method of initial rates and we find out that it's, it is in fact second order. You increase your concentration of nucleophile, the reaction goes faster. You increase your concentration of your halide, the reaction also goes faster. Makes, makes sense. That tells us right off the bat that we're going through a single step mechanism, right? It's going to be that SN2 mechanism. Because if it was going through the multiple steps, we would only have one thing in our rate law. It wouldn't be a second order rate law. Right, and a good analogy would be a, a concerted, I, if you think of the molecules like cars, a concerted mechanism would be like two cars getting involved in a crash. You need both cars for that to happen, right? You can't have a two car collision with only one car. So increasing the number of cars is going to increase that rate. A, a first order reaction would be like um, a tire blowing out a tire. It doesn't matter how many other cars are on the road, the probability of your car blowing a tire is the same, right? The number of other cars is not gonna affect that. So in this case, because, because it's second order, that tells us that we have a two car collision, basically. We need both of these things to run into each other. Um, they also notice though, that if, if you add methyl groups on the active carbon, it slows the reaction down. Sorry, so where is, that's the one. Um, so that tells us the fact that the reaction is second order tells us we have a potential energy surface that looks like this. It's a single step. You've got A plus B, they run into each other to make a transition state, and then you get your products. Um, and frequently this symbol here that looks like a little double crossed T, um, historically it's, a, it's called double dagger because if you look at really old textbooks um, after they did, you know, asterisk or, and then they would do another form, this would be like the third thing they would do to indicate instead of an asterisk. It actually looked like two little knives pointing at each other. 
um, with the, um, and so they call it double dagger. Um, that symbol just means transition state. It means you've got some weird thing happening here that doesn't look like a normal Lewis dot structure where you're breaking bonds and forming bonds at the same time. Um, so the fact that it was second order tells us our potential energy surface looks like this. Therefore, the transition state involves both reactants. Right? That's our two-car collision. You need two cars for a two-car collision. They also noticed that when you add methyl groups to the active carbons, so the active carbon is the one that has the halogen on it that's going through the substitution reaction. And they noticed that if you add methyl groups, the reaction slows down, which doesn't make any sense because it's it doesn't change the equilibrium constant because we're still making and breaking the same types of bonds, but it makes the reaction slow down. So what is what do these two molecules have different around the active carbon? What do you notice? If you're carbon instead of a hydrogen, well, carbons instead of a hydrogen. And what do, what do we know about carbons? Go think back to chair conformers. What do we know about methyl groups versus hydrogens in chair conformers? Uh, you, you get more strain. More strain, right? They they physically take up more space. Basically, in what that tells us is that you need your nucleophile has to be able to get to the active carbon for this to happen. So now we're not just talking about a two-car collision. We're talking about a two-car collision where you specifically hit the other car, rear end of the other car. Right, so that changes how likely it is to happen, right? You are you might be less likely to be able to rear end another car if there's a bunch of stuff between you and them. Maybe that's not the best analogy at this point, but um, so maybe we'll leave behind the car, car accident analogy, but basically there's more stuff around the middle. Um, what my old OCHEM professor, and I think this is actually, I've seen this in other textbooks now. So I did, I thought it was just my OCHEM professor being weird. Um, he used to call it spinach. Got too much spinach around the active site. Um, just means that you've got a bunch of other junk in the way, getting in, in the way of your nucleophile coming in and attaching here. Um, so that tells us that our nucleophile needs to be able to get to the active carbon. That's part of the mechanism. So now we have one last bit of information. And that tells us that our, it tells us only one stereoisomer is, is observed. If we start with a, with a specific stereoisomer and go through this reaction, we only get one stereoisomer out the other side. What that means is that we're limited as to which route we can take for our nucleophile to approach. Our nucleophile can't go through either one or two because if our nucleophile attacked from side one, we would get one stereoisomer. And if it attacked from side two, we'd get the other stereoisomer because we'd be flipping A, B, and C here. In other words, this would be the view from the nucleophile if, as the nucleophile approached the carbon. If it approached from side one, it would look like this. You'd have A, B, and C going counterclockwise. If, if it approached from position two, it'd be going counterclock. I had those backwards. Counterclockwise from site one and clockwise from site two. Right. If you if you think about the view of the nucleophile approaching the carbon, it's going to be flipped if it's approaching from side one versus side two. So what is the fact that if we only see one stereoisomer, what does that tell us? Why is that significant? So I mean there's only one way the daylight can attach. Exactly. It means it can't be go through one or two 
it can only go from one of these sides. Which of these sides would make the most sense? You've got a nucleophile, which either has a partial negative or a full negative charge. And you've got your leaving group, which is usually a halide, which has a lot of electrons, right? And is electronegative. Would it make sense for your nucleophile to come in right next to the leaving group? Or is it going to approach from the opposite side? Or the opposite side? Yeah. It's going to approach from the opposite side, and it's it's that's referred to, and this is one of the funnier terms in in organic chemistry, is, is a backside attack. Um, a backside attack is a scientific term that's describing a nucleophilic substitution. And it specifically tells us we're only going to see things approach from the exact opposite side as our leaving group. Um, and we can actually look at this in terms of orbitals too. And I didn't make a high, super high resolution of this when I made this figure a while ago. Um, but those calculations that we practiced running the other day on games, um, I actually ran the calculations myself for these reactions to make these figures because you can actually get really, really good figures if you do that. Um, I probably still have the files somewhere that I could upgrade the resolution, but um, what, what you actually see happening is if your nucleophile has a, a p orbital or an sp2 orbital, something with a negative charge and a lot of electron density, um, as it approaches the target carbon, you actually start, if you look at the sigma star orbital, remember star was the anti-bonding orbital. So instead of having a lot of constructive interference between the the orbitals, the antibonding orbital had destructive interference. And you wind up with this sort of extra bunch of electron density in the antibonding orbital. As you bring your nucleophile up, it actually starts filling in that antibonding orbital, which makes it lower and lower in energy until the antibonding orbital is actually lower in energy than the bonding orbital, which basically means as you add electrons to an antibonding orbital, you start breaking the orbital that goes along with it, the bonding orbital that goes with it, right? So all of this hybridization and looking at these molecular orbitals is not just pure numbers. It also matches with what our evidence shows. You need to bring in your nucleophile to the side that has the sigma star orbital or else it won't react. You'll notice that there's very little electron density over here that a nucleophile could start bonding with. You have to bring it in from the opposite side. And as a result, you wind up basically pushing the leaving group out because those electrons start being pulled towards the nucleophile. And if your leaving group is a better leaving group than your nucleophile is, your leaving group leaves. And so that means our transition state looks really, really simple to draw for these SN2. And this is the one time you get to draw five things around a carbon at the same time. Um, but it's still not breaking our rules because what we're drawing is we have three bonds that are the same. Three of our sigma bonds didn't change. The fourth sigma bond is being broken as the electrons between the carbon and our leaving group our leaving group takes those electrons with it, and our nucleophile is bringing its electrons in. And so we actually wind up with a transition state where your carbon actually looks totally planar. It might not be perfectly planar depending on the size of your leaving group and stuff like that, but it's gonna be really close to being totally flat. It's not sp3 at this point. And so, but what that means as far as the stereochemistry goes is we actually go through what's, what's referred to as an umbrella flip. It's basically like an umbrella. If you think of those three hydrogens as being an umbrella, when it's a tetrahedral carbon like this, those three, car those three hydrogens are all sort of shaped like an umbrella, if you think about it that way. And as you bring your nucleophile in, that's like, filling up the inside of your umbrella with wind. 
And when it comes in there, it basically goes from being flipped like this to being flipped inside out. So everything stays in the same position. It just gets booted to the other side of your molecule, which means we wind up keeping the same similar stereochemistry. Everything stays in the same spot. Everything just gets flipped inside out. All right, let's. So let's do these two. We have three minutes here. Let's do some practice with this. Assuming these go through the SN2 mechanism, so it's going to be concerted, and you're only going to get the backside attack, what would the product be for each of these? So I just took the that top reaction and I blew up the um, the active carbon that has the chlorine attached to it. And we have hydroxide is going to be acting as our nucleophile. So if we're going to see this this substitution happen, we're going to have the chlorine leaving, and we're going to replace it with the hydroxide. As far as what the stereochemistry is going to look like, though, this hydroxide has to approach from the opposite side of the chlorine. So if the chlorine is sticking out towards us, oxygen has to come from, from behind. So that means we actually wind up with, so our mechanism would look like that. Just chloride leaves, hydroxide comes in and attacks. The product though, is basically gonna flip this hydrogen forward like a light switch. Really it's gonna push all three of them, but if we just leave these ones as being in the plane of the board, basically if your hydrogen was sticking backward and then the hydroxide comes in this way, it's going to flip forward to be away from the hydroxide now. So our product in this case is going to look like the hydrogen now comes forward. Our hydroxide is backwards, which means we look like There's our pentane. There's our product. So we, you kind of have to be able to visualize these in 3D to some extent to be able to see why that is. We wind up flipping the stereo center, but it's, it's conserved, meaning that every, if you start with the same, with only one stereoisomer, with only the R, your product will give you only the S. You won't get a mixture of the two stereoisomers. You'll be, you'll get only one stereoisomer if you go through this mechanism. And so if we looked at the second example here, our product is going to look like, do the exact same thing. The, the NH2 is going to be our, that two should be subscript, it's a um, amide ion. <laughs> 
Um, so nothing about the rest of the molecule has changed, right? So our methyl group and our cyclopentane are all the same. Our NH2 with a negative charge, the negative charge is gonna come in here from opposite of the bromine. So from the behind the hydrogen or in front of the hydrogen from our point of view. And then the bromine leaves. So then the hydrogen would get flipped into the board and our product would look like that plus a bromide. And this one would be plus, um, plus chloride would be our, our byproduct in this case. Right. So a simple mechanism, but the simple mechanism actually winds up meaning we have to be very careful with it because it's so simple and concerted means that we have to pay attention to our stereochemistry. Um, we can't just get sloppy with that because, because it's a simple, very specific mechanism, our product is going to be very specific as well. All right, we are a few minutes over. Let me stop the recording. Actually, before I stop the recording, reminder, only going to be meeting for 10 minutes today in lab. Watch for that announcement to go out in a few minutes um, where you can sign up for your time slot um, and then use that extra time to make sure you get out and vote. And um, I will see you guys later today or later this week. If you can't make it this afternoon, just email me and let me know. Thanks, Sean.